We're doing our best to learn to build our lives on the promises of God as opposed to the problems in life. And each week we're looking at one of the many promises in Scripture, finding a person who embodies that promise. This week the promise, I might go as far as to say it's my favorite. Boy, it's close. It sure makes the short list. Philippians chapter 2 in verse 13. It is God who works where, church? In you. It is God who works in you. And the example is found in the New Testament. Yes, we move from Old Testament examples down to the New Testament, and we look at the life and the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. But before we do, we always make this declaration. If you're new to Oak Hills, welcome thankful that you're here. What we do is we sit up straight and we put our shoulders back and we fill our lungs with air and our hearts with hope and we have monitors who if they see us and our posture's bad, you get in trouble. (laughs) Just kidding. Let's do it, shall we? Say it like you mean it. We are building our lives on the promises of God because... Yes, Lord, we do. And grant that we can do so with deeper faith. You sure took a special one home last week, Billy Graham. And we pray for his family and the ongoing ministry of the Billy Graham Association. And please forgive our speaker. His sins are so many and help us to see Jesus, just Jesus. Through Jesus we pray. And all the church said. From 1983 until 1988, our family lived in South America. We lived in the city of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And while there in the 80s, uh, we owned a ham radio. Now, some of you are gonna have to ask your parents or your grandparents what a ham radio is. Uh, Please uh, reveal your age by raising your hand if you know what a ham radio is. Yeah, a bunch of old folks here today. (laughs) In the days prior to affordable international calls and certainly prior to email, the most affordable way to stay in communication uh, if you lived overseas was a ham radio. And uh, so I I got a ham radio and had a ham radio license. Papa Yankee One Zulu Alpha Bravo, thank you very much. (laughs) And so every week we would communicate with our family via the ham radio. Now, when we went on trips, I was careful to unplug the ham radio. Why would I do that? Well, because there was an antenna on the roof and lightning strikes, it destroys the ham radio. And so, uh, you know, if I'm gone for several days, storm might come. And so I would always unplug the ham radio. One time, my wife and I, Deanlin, and I left to go on a, I think it was a seven day trip. And uh, I was out the apartment and I realized, oh my goodness, I forgot to unplug the ham radio. And so I hurried back into the apartment and went into the utility room where that refrigerator was and where the ham radio was, and I unplugged what I thought was... (laughs) Why are you groaning? (laughs) I ended up unplugging, guess what? The refrigerator. Now you know uh, it was summertime in Brazil, (laughs) and Rio gets hot, and um, we lived on the 14th floor of a 14th story apartment building, so it's even hotter. And so for seven days, this refrigerator, not this one, but a refrigerator, I sat in a sweltering apartment, unplugged. So when we came home, Deanlin opened up the refrigerator and what happened? Oh, oh, it was putrid. It was a moving experience. And so when we, when she, I should say, found out who unplugged (laughs) the refrigerator, guess who was tasked with cleaning it out? So how do you clean out the inside of something that's putrid and stinky? 
Well, fortunately, she was married to a smart person. <laughs> so I got a bucket, and I filled it with soapy water, and I got a rag, and I cleaned the exterior of the refrigerator. I mean every square inch. When I was finished, that refrigerator could have passed a marine boot camp inspection. It was sparkling on the outside. So when I cleaned the exterior, I opened the interior, and guess what? It still stunk. So that didn't work. Hmm. I thought I know what I need to do. Poor refrigerator needs a social life. I mean, I would stink too if I spent all my time alone in a utility room. So I threw a party. And I invited all the appliances from the apartment building to come. We filled the house with appliances. Boy, was it a fun party. Some of the toasters hadn't seen each other since the appliance store days. We played all kinds of games, like pin the plug in the socket. <laughs> we told jokes about limited warranties. The blenders were the hit, however. You know, they mix so well. <laughs> you know, even the early service laughed better. Than <laughs> well, I s assumed that by improving the social life of the refrigerator, the interior would be improved. Well, guess what? I opened it up, oh, it was still terrible. I was running out of options. So I thought to myself, what, what, what can we do? I know. We need to give the refrigerator some status. So I put a Mercedes Benz sticker on it. And then a little cultural sensitivity, I got a Save the Whales sticker and placed it on there. And then just so he could have some spending power, I got him a credit card, a Max the card. <laughs> put a cell phone before cell phones were invented. I put one on here. I gave this, I even put cologne on top of the refrigerator thinking just a little better status. This thing was cool. It, it, it could have made the cover of Popular Mechanics magazine. But when I opened it up, guess what? Still stunk. I was completely out of options and then I got desperate. I'm almost embarrassed to say this. I decided that the refrigerator, to get the inside clean, it just needed some high voltage pleasure. So I went down and I bought a Play Fridge magazine. You know, the kind that have pictures with the doors open. <laughs> I rented a, a, a romantic film for the refrigerator. It was called The Big Chill. I tried to arrange a date with the refrigerator with the Westinghouse down the hall. She refused. Gave him the cold shoulder. <laughs> Nothing worked, but still, I left him with that after hours entertainment. Opened the door, guess what? Still stunk. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Locato, the only thing worse than your sense of humor <laughs> is your common sense. Who in their right mind would think you could clean the inside by focusing on the outside? You really wanna know. Every human being has within them some stuff that needs to get cleaned out. And some of this comes from wounds. Some of this comes from mistakes. Some of this stink comes from decisions we've made or actions that were inflicted upon us. But regardless, there's some things inside of us that, that we don't like and others don't like 
When we try to clean the inside by just changing the outside, by just changing the, the appearance or the social circle or the type of entertainment, when we think that can bring about long-lasting, permanent change, we're missing one of the great promises in the Bible. And that is that God is willing to change us in a miraculous inward way from the inside out. The Apostle Paul reduced it down to a sentence in Colossians 1.27. He said, the mystery in a nutshell is just this. Can you say that phrase with me? Christ is in you. You see, a Christian is a person in whom Christ is happening. A Christian is a person in whom Christ is happening. It's somewhat of a spiritual heart transplant. The old heart is removed and a new heart, a new being is deposited within us. The Apostle Paul, again, this time when he wrote the church in Galatia, said, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until, can you say this last phrase with me? Christ is formed in you. You see, the Apostle envisioned that when a person becomes a Christian, that Christ takes up residence within them. The old engine is removed and a Ferrari is deposited. And this essence of Christ, this presence of Christ is undeniably changing who we are from the inside out. That is to say, it's not up to us to change ourselves. It's up to us to cooperate with the change that's already there. And every element, every characteristic of Christ is deposited in us supernaturally when we give our heart to Christ. For this reason, the scripture calls becoming a Christian being born again. Because a brand new presence is deposited within the believer. Now, I didn't get this for many years. I didn't. I got all the other prepositions. I believed that Christ was for me, that Christ was above me, Christ was with me, ahead of me, behind me. But this idea of Christ inside me, I don't know how I missed it. I I can't blame it on the Apostle Paul. He refers to the indwelling presence of Christ in the believer 216 times in his epistles. 216 times. And John the apostle refers to it 26 times. And I believe that a message that comes from the great story of the birth of Christ is the promise that what happened to Mary happens to every believer. Yes, the story of Mary is more than a Christmas story. It's a story of regeneration. Uh, Let let me show you. you. You remember the uncommon moment. Don't be afraid, the angel told Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. Oh, come on, Mary could have said. You gotta be kidding. That's not gonna happen. But she didn't. Surely with a prayer and maybe with a swallow, she replied, behold the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And so it was. And so it was that Christ was deposited within her and she became pregnant before she had sex. It was a miraculous deposit of the presence of Christ within her. The fetus of Jesus grew and grew and grew. Wonder what that was like. What's it like to have Christ within you growing, taking up more space, changing the interior, 
changing the way you appear, growing so large until finally Christ has to come out. And you know it's a miracle because you didn't do anything to make it happen. Such a story troubles people. Such a story about Mary troubles people. In fact, the, the response historically to the story of Mary has caused people to go to one or two extremes with the story of Mary. Just real quickly, these two unfortunate responses. Mary can't be, un, can't be common. She, she, she must be some, I don't know, a form of, of, of deity, some supernatural pure person. She can't be just a common villager like she's presented in scripture. I mean, this is too extraordinary. And so some people, they glorify Mary. They magnify Mary, and they turn Mary into somebody who's otherly, who's untouchable, not like us. In fact, there are millions of people who pray through Mary, even some to Mary. This is contrary to Scripture. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. But the challenge and the danger of, of glorifying Mary is that we take her out of the normal person status. When I think one of the purposes of the story of Mary is to tell us that God does something with normal people, Amen. like you and me. And then there are other people who go to the other extreme. And they, they don't glorify Mary. They, they minimize Mary. They, they say, this is just a... It's just a legend, this whole thing of a virgin birth. It just, when, when we can't figure something out, we'll just call them a legend, call it a legend. The, 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 the creation, that's a legend. The, the story of Noah's Ark, that's the burning bush. All of these, they're just, they're just non-historical sagas and myths. Well, the problem, there are several problems with doing that. Well, one of which is that the story of the virgin birth of Jesus I'm sorry, the birth of Jesus through the Virgin Mary is not presented in Scripture as a saga. Some things are presented in Scripture. There's allegorical language. There's metaphysical language. But, but the story of, of the birth of Christ is presented in historical language so as to present this really happened. There was a real Bethlehem. There was a real census. There was a real Herod. These are historical facts. So there must have been a Mary and a Joseph and the story of Mary giving birth to Jesus as a virgin must be historical. That's what the early church believed. That's what the early church fathers believed, some of whom were martyred because of their conviction in part about the virgin birth. One well-known church father, Arist Arist Aristides, in 140 AD wrote about the virgin birth of Christ. And then there was the birth, I'm sorry, the martyrdom of Ignatius in 170 AD. All th th These are men who lived within a few generations. So if the church fathers and the church, I'm sorry, the gospel authors saw no reason to dismiss the virgin birth of Christ, why would we? Yes, why would we? Why would we? The story of the birth of Christ miraculously deposited within the womb of Mary is a picture for us. There is in this story this unbelievable invitation. And that is what happened to Mary can happen to you and can happen to me. The supernatural deposit of his son in your life. Scripture is replete with these declarations. Jesus lives inside his children. To the apostles, Jesus said, I am in you. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was that Christ may dwell where? In your hearts through faith. What is the mystery of the gospel? It is Christ in you the hope of glory. John was clear, those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with them. Christ isn't just for you or with you, of course he is that, but he is in you. He was a fetus in Mary, he is a force in you. Here's what I'm saying, and that is when you give your heart to Christ, he returns the favor, and everything about Christ is supernaturally deposited within you. 
We're not talking about joining an organization like you might join the Boy Scouts or, or become a fan of an organization like you might become a fan of the football team. When you give your heart to Christ, we're talking about the greatest event that will ever happen in a person's life. And that is every attribute of Christ is placed within you, invisibly yet undeniably. Everything about Christ is placed within you. Now, I believe, and I think you'll agree, that this is cause for high optimism. Because there are times I don't like who I am. There are times you don't like who I am. But my response to that need not be some exterior, odd alteration of environment. My response to that needs to be, I'm going to stand on the promise of Christ. And that is God is inside me. And he is changing me day after day, hour after hour, year after year. And there is within me and there is within you the presence of Christ growing so much that at some point he cannot help but come out. This means that the self-control of Christ is within you. Could you use some self-control? It's in there. This means that the grace of Christ is within you. You having a hard time forgiving that jerk? It's in there. There's some grace that you can find. The hope of of Christ, the long suffering of Christ, the kindness of Christ, the compassion of Christ. Every attribute of Christ is within you, just waiting to come out. The presence of Christ, the mystery of Christ is within you. There is within you the very power that called Christ out from the grave has taken up residence within you. Now I know exactly what you're thinking. You're saying, Max, If I have all of Christ in me, why do I still behave so much like me? Well, Christ isn't finished with you yet, but he's working on you. He is committed to take up your power, I'm sorry, his power, and activate within you his strength. Now this happens as we engage with him, as we walk with him. When we open our scriptures and read truth, it activates the presence of Christ within us. When we bow our heads and we pray, Lord, come, that activates the presence of Christ within us. When we lift up our hands and worship, when we get on our knees and offer our hearts, when we take steps of faith, of obedience, all of these things are activating the very presence of Christ within us. But there is a new you, a better you, an exciting you, a more lovable you that will come out. It will. Don't you look at me like that. It's going to come out. You don't get down on yourself. You don't beat yourself up. You're, You're a chosen vessel of the almighty God. And he has chosen to live within you. Again, this was such a theme of the Apostle Paul. He said, for this purpose I labor, striving according to whose power? His power, his power, which mightily works where? In me. Now, I think many churchgoers make the mistake that I made for many years, and that is that Christ has plenty power to save me but then it's up to me to stay saved and get better. That's not right. The same power that saves you, the same power that puts your name in the book of life in heaven, the same grace that rescues you is the same power that keeps you saved and that begins to change you more and more day by day into the image of Jesus Christ. He did it, and he does it. What what did Mary do? What was her role in the miracle? What was her role? Did she say, okay, well, I guess I better figure out how this works and do something special. I better assist you, God, in making, no. She said, I'm a handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to your will. Okay, I ain't worth much. 
I, that's what I hear. I mean, I'm a handmaiden, I, but, but you can do it. I'm gonna trust you. She didn't assist God, nor did she resist God. She didn't say, do you know how bad I've been? Do you know some of the thoughts I have? Do you know how unworthy I am? Yeah, that might be true for somebody somewhere, but not, she didn't assist God. She just said, okay, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. She didn't resist God. She didn't say, well, I'm not good enough. She just said, let it be unto me according to your word. That's a conversion statement, church. That's what a person says when they come to Christ. They say, okay, <laughs> let it be unto me. as according to your word. My prayer for you, dear child of God, is that you and I would so long for God to come into our hearts that all we would do is say, okay, Lord, just let it happen. And open ourselves up to this wonderful mystery that Christ has taken up residence within us. And we would abandon all hope of trying to improve ourselves through exterior alterations. But we would enter into this extraordinary adventure of walking in tandem, in unity with the Lord Jesus Christ, inviting him to take over and to change us from the inside out until we could, some, dare we someday say, what the Apostle Paul said, that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives where? In me. That someday we would think, yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen Max. It's no longer Max who lives. Max and all of his prejudice, Max and all of his irritability, Max and all of his moodiness, Max and all of his crankiness, Max and all of his negatives, and Max and all of his bad, sour outlook. You know what? It's, I haven't seen that in a long time. Thank you, Lord. It's no longer Max who lives. You see, legally, that transaction has happened, okay? That happened when Max gave his heart to Christ. His name was forever changed in heaven. So the legal transaction has happened. The existential, the, the actuality of that is happening. So a Christian is a person in whom Christ has happened and in whom Christ is happening. Does that work? It's happened legally. I can't lose it even if I foul up because I now belong to Christ. And it's happening because he's changing me from the inside out. Now, why is he doing that? I and mean, why didn't he just call us to heaven? I mean, when we're baptized, why, do we, why can't we just go wet to the pearly gates? <laughs> you know, just, why? My mom asked me that so many times in her latter years. She died at the age of 89. In the last two or three years, struggled so with her health. She'd say, why, Max? Why am I still here? I said, I, I don't know, Mom, it, except that there must be some Jesus in you that needs to come out to help others. There's some Jesus in you, dear church, that the Lord is wanting to release into your neighborhood, into your home, into your family, to your children, to your grandchildren, you are the presence of Christ. You're the fragrance of Christ. You know the Bible says you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when you walk into a building, you are the presence of Christ in that building. And when you're at a board meeting or when you're on an airplane or when you're, when you're taking your kids to school, Jesus just showed up. And as you and I begin to understand and relate more and more to Jesus, we'll speak more with the words of Christ, think more with the mind of Christ. Our hands will actually have the touch of Christ. We'll, we'll have power to speak words of healing and encouragement and something supernatural and mystical will happen in our relationships. I guess that's why we're still here, church. I mean, I'm like you, I, I'm ready to go. But apparently there's more of Jesus that needs to come out. So I, I need to wrap this up. But I just urge you, stand on this promise. Let this promise change the way you see you. You are not the sum total of some bad decisions. You're not. 
We've all made bad decisions, but let me tell you something. <laughs> You're the presence of Christ. You are Christ in a room. You are. You're highly favored. You're chosen. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're an ambassador of God. You're the fragrance of Christ. Don't let the devil tell you otherwise. You are who God says you are. Let the promise of Christ working in you change the way you see you. Let it change the way you see your future. Yeah, you got some hangups. God knows that. Talk to him about them and say, Lord, can we take that one on now? Uh, can we take on my bad attitude? Can, can you please help me, Lord, get this tongue under control? And so you begin talking to him. We call that confession. Confession's not a bad thing. Confession is simply agreeing with God. God, there's some work that needs to be done. Can we get on to it, please? And oh, the Lord loves to hear that. And so he begins and continues this work within you, and you begin to change. And the people around you begin to notice. And the smell disappears. Not because of what you do, but it's all because of what Christ does. It is God who works in you. Amen. Amen. Grant, O oh, Heavenly Father, that we can see ourselves like you see us as the living presence of Jesus Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, <laughs>